Yay! What is up, everyone? Welcome to Ginger Runner Live, episode number 354. Tonight's a special episode. Uh, it, it, I say tonight. And by tonight, you mean this afternoon. This afternoon. Here in the Pacific Northwest on the West Coast of the United States, it is currently 1 p.m., but over in the UK, it is closer to 9 p.m., and our guest is coming to us from the UK. We're, we're excited any, any chance that we get to, in, uh, to interview an international ultra runner or adventurer uh, tonight. It is our good friend, John Kelly, who's coming to us from the UK. We're going to talk about the Pennine Way FKT that he just set. It's been readjusted three times in the last year alone. It's been this uh, amazing thing to follow. Uh, John just set the new fastest known time on it, and it was such a cool, cool thing to follow. So we have John joining us all the way from the UK. I'm very excited about tonight's show. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I keep saying tonight. Yeah, it's not going to I'm going to keep saying it. It's for our uh, UK audience or our European audience. I can say tonight. Really? Like, yeah, it's, yeah, it's it night. It is tonight. It's night. Uh, so cool. Sit back, relax, everyone. Welcome to the show. Ginger Runner Live begins now. Ginger Runner. Yay! <laughs> what is up, everyone? Welcome to Ginger Runner Live, episode number 354. Thank you for taking some time out of your busy Monday evenings or afternoons. After, yeah. Mm -hmm. Spend a little bit of it with us. Uh, today, tonight, uh, we, we're doing an earlier show because there is a time difference between us and our guest. But I'm very excited about it because we get to have one of the coolest, uh, 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 most fantastic ultra runners and adventurers on Earth joining us today, John Kelly. Uh, one of the finishers of the Barkley Marathons also has really put his stamp on some incredible routes through uh, across the UK. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about the Pennine Way FKT that he mm -hmm. just set, reset. Uh, I need to know more about this route. I need to know more about what John's been up to in the UK other than this. Uh, we have a lot of catching up to do. Uh, so our guest tonight, John Kelly, will be, uh, we'll introduce him here in just a second. But of course, it's not just our wonderful guest or myself. We're also joined by the wonderful Kim. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm doing well. Good. Hi, everyone. Kim Tajima Newberry here, as always. If you're new, welcome, because we're doing this at kind of a funky hour for us. We have people from all different places joining us today. So we have folks coming from Ireland, London, everywhere. It's really fun to see all of the names that we usually get more in like the archive version. Yeah, it's super um, awesome. Because I think it's usually like the middle of the night when we normally go live on Mondays. So hi, everybody. If you're new, welcome. If you have questions for our guest, John, you can ask him in the chat room. Uh, Easy Dexter in the chat room says, hi, uh, I'm actually on the Pennine Way right now. We hope that you're oh. not trying to set an FKT. And JD Moore in the chat room says, live? Really? I can watch live from Germany? Awesome. Yeah. Uh, so it's really fun. It's really fun to... Uh, See everyone saying hi from from the places we normally don't get to see during our live show yeah and because we are live you do get to ask questions of john so please drop them into the chat room kim keep an eye on it she's got a bunch of questions already pulled from our discord server uh the discord server is for our gr crew and that's where we like to just start the show is to mention our gr crew they are our patreon supporters uh it is because of them that we're even able to do this show we don't really do sponsors they are our sponsors so it's kind of pbs in a sense where we are uh viewer sponsored um it is because of our gr crew we're able to do live shows reviews films all sorts of good stuff if you would like to join all you got to do is go to patreon.com slash the ginger runner and you can join us for our after shows our daily live streams all the cool behind the scenes content two individuals in particular at that top tier really uh have set themselves apart uh, rick bjarnison out of bc british columbia he and his company cheeky monkey media.ca they're a web design company they completely redid the gingerrunner.com website He's an ultra runner. He's awesome. Uh, and Brian Sands, longtime supporter, truly inspirational runner, lost 100 pounds in his journey, ran his first marathon. Was it October? He ran his first 100 miler just this last year. Brian, DIY 100, DIY 100 miler, 100 miler during yeah. the pandemic. <laughs> so a huge shout out to both Brian and Rick. We appreciate you both. I think we introduced John. I think we should. <laughs> Without further ado. That's what everyone's here for. They're not here for us, honestly. I'm like, all right, we get it. We get it. Enough of this. Let's talk to John. Uh, couldn't agree more. Without further ado, uh, we'd love to welcome our guest coming to us all the way from the UK. He's very patient with us uh, in, in adjusting the time and stuff like that. John Kelly, how are you, my friend? Yay, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Doing great. 
it's uh, g- good to connect. It's it's good to have a, a nice little window uh, back into the U.S. a bit here. It's been over a year f- for me, and uh, you're, you're wearing this kind of new sports headgear for some team <laughs> that I don't even know existed. Uh, so, you know, it's it's great. Uh, this is a Mariners hat, and I think most Isn't local. Is baseball what? America's favorite pastime? It's America's favorite the pastime. The Mariners changed their logo? Oh, this is the old what logo. Is the <laughs> old logo. But oh, I think geez. the good thing, John, is you don't have to worry, because I don't even think locals know who the Mariners are anymore. They just got off of a terrible losing streak. So <laughs> it's quite all right. I know that your life around sport now is probably just football. Is it just football-based stuff? I, you know, I've kind of lost track of, of all of it, except for running, to be honest. But, you know, I, I grew up a, a huge Rangers fan. So there were some epic battles for the basement of the AL West uh, between <laughs> and the Rangers. I'm I'm confident the Mariners will hold on to it for a while longer. Um, just speaking of running, it's obvious that uh, uh, I think, the, yeah, the last time we connected, was it a year ago? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, uh, about that, well, a, a bit less than a year, uh, right, probably a after the nine way last year, or maybe my, my grand round, um, one of those the, two. Yeah, it was yeah, the grand round. grand round. And I mean, let's just, let's just sort of start there. Cause obviously the last year has been different, uh, for m- runners across the world, depending on what country they're in and how they've, uh, had restrictions and, and lockdowns and stuff like that. You still managed to get some incredible efforts out there in the last year. How has that been for you coming from a background of competitive athletics from uh, triathlon to trail running to ultra running and everything like that to have it sort of shift to DIY efforts like having to do FKT attempts and stuff like that? Has that been an easy transition, something that you really enjoyed or are you chomping at the bit to get back to, to racing racing? Uh, so it's it's been great. And, and honestly, for the most part, my schedule hasn't been affected a huge amount by COVID. Uh, the one race that I haven't been able to do uh, that I, I had planned was Barkley. Uh, last year I was there and it was canceled. And this right. year it was there and I couldn't travel d- due to, to COVID restrictions. So otherwise, these are some of the big challenges that, that I had planned um, that, that did carry uh, a lot of appeal to me uh, to begin with. So there's been some added fun competitive elements to that with Damien and I going Damien Hall and myself going back and forth on the Penine way. Um, so it's, uh, I'm, I'm definitely excited, uh, whenever I can get back to my next race. Um, but it's, this is something that I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed, uh, in the meantime. It's been fun to talk to, to different guests on the show over the last year to find out how competition doesn't need to involve pinning a bib on, and uh, you talk about you and Damien. I want to give a huge hat tip and a shout out to Damien Hall, who I believe is starting his own FKT attempt of something different today. I, I think I just saw on Twitter that he's starting something crazy and awesome. Um, but we've yeah, had conversations. Go ahead. He, he's doing the, the coast to coast, coast um, to which coast. is about 185 miles. Basically, I just ran north to south across most of England. Um, and he's about to run west to east. Um, across England, uh, is the thin part or the the thicker part? <laughs> oh, the, we're the thin a, part. Yeah. yeah, thin part. Okay, we got a little <laughs> blip of signal there, but we got it. Thin so part. The, the thinner, but the more, but the, the more. We'll be patient with the signal because I think the internet has to go across the ocean. <laughs> Sorry, John, we just lost you there a little bit. So you said thin, <laughs> thinner part across the UK. But go ahead and finish that thought. Sorry. But more mountainous part. Got it. Th- thinner, but more mountainous. Got it. Totally makes sense. Yeah, there's already like some comments in the chat room about Damien. Leon says, I want to know how long he's going to let Damien have the coast to coast record if he gets it this week. <laughs> and Joanne asks, will we see you on the Wainwrights with him this week? Any joint adventures? Uh, so not not at the moment. Um, it, you know, we've, we've both got, a, I think, a, a pretty full set of plans for the the summer but uh yeah i, I mean it's it, there, there's so many great trails and, and great routes over here that it's it's really impossible to to do them all um I, i'd love to uh take them all on but gotta fit in a few that i can to, to be sure that i'm 
you know, put, putting forth a, a good effort on each of them. I, you know, just kind of mentioning Damien at the top here, before we start to dive into your FKT attempt, I think, um, we've been talking a lot personally about community and the trail community and, and how we are all connected, especially with the tragedy that happened in China just this last weekend. And we talked about it on daily brew. And I just want to take a second to recognize that our hearts are, are, are going out to everyone involved with that. And it's obviously the, the ripples have affected the entire trail running community around the world, mm -hmm. but it's really helped us to, to look at like just how connected we are across the globe. And this relationship between you and Damien, it seems, uh, uh, did you know each other before you moved to the UK, before you started these efforts? Like, ha had you heard of each other or did you have a friendship brewing? And how has that evolved? Because it seems like you guys are good friends now. Like there's some good ribbing and stuff like that. So how has that relationship evolved? We knew of each other, um, but it, yeah, hadn't hadn't really spoken until when I came over here and I gave my first attempt at my grand round just a little over a month after I moved here. And he came out and supported me on that. And that was really my my first that experience was my first introduction to the UK community here. And it was just amazing that here's this guy that moved over here and takes off on this kind of brash challenge uh, a month later. And, and here are all of these people that, that pour out uh, to support me on this just the entire time. Um, road support, running support. Here's this guy that finished fourth at UTMB that's driving up to Wales to, to run uh, a few legs with me uh, on that. So it's been amazing to see. Um, and, and yeah, we've we've definitely uh, supported one another with, with a bit of a competitiveness uh, in there as well. It's so, I mean, honestly, man, as an outsider, it's fun to watch. It's so fun to watch. <laughs> and we know like you are an incredibly positive and kind human. And, and I haven't met Damien, but it seems like he's the exact same, just so much fun, uh, gentle ribbing, but also like endless support. So that's a, that's a wonderful thing that we're, that we're seeing. And we really appreciate you guys just being so cool with all that too. And we saw it with uh, with Dylan and Tyler Green around the yeah. Wonderland FKT, mm -hmm. which we've talked about here. Uh, we have tons of questions for you, John, in the live chat room. I want to make sure we don't ignore the live chat room. Kim, what do we got? Yeah, a question from Phil, since you're just kind of kind of talking about it here. Phil asked, what has John found most different about moving from the U.S. and plugging into the traditions of the U.K. fell running scene? Uh, so there's, there's such an established tradition here uh, with so many of these things that have been going back decades or, or longer uh, when you look at things like the Bob Graham round. And for me, I, I'd say, you know, people often ask me to, to compare the, the support and, and the community uh, around some of these efforts. And here it's just, it's so much more concentrated mm. uh, where pretty much everyone's from within driving distance of, of everything. Uh, whereas in the U.S., you, you have your pockets, you know, you've got the Pacific Northwest and you've got the East Coast and you've got Flagstaff as kind of its own thing. Um, and, and here it's 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 consolidated and everyone is, is so excited to, to support one another to, to get out and um, push these different challenges and, and see how high uh, we can set the bar on them. So that's um, been been pretty cool to see. And. and the aspect of fell running that I really enjoy that is, is quite different in the U.S. where we have established trails uh, is, is fell running is, is much more creativity, kind of, kind of freestyle. Mm -hmm. Like the objective is go tag that peak and that peak and that peak and that peak. I don't care how you get there. Um, just just hit the peak. Uh, whereas in the U.S., it, it's much more you're running a, a fixed trail uh, right. that you can't deviate from. It seems organic and it seems almost artistic in a way of how you connect peaks and there's a there's a style uh to it that i think gives character i haven't had the privilege of running in the fells or uh, anywhere in the uk other than london uh which was super fun because i would run on the wrong side of the road um <laughs> but i do remember or hearing and, and and hearing these stories of fell running and just the adventure that's even the simplest couple mile a couple kilometer run can turn into a full-on adventure and just Beautiful, beautiful terrain. I want to pull up here, uh, John. You won't be able to see it, but the uh, the actual audience, live audience, will. This is sort of the GPS map that we've been we were following, John, on the Pennine Way. Uh, this is available to anyone who wants to go view it. You can just Google uh, Pennine Way tracking. 
John Kelly, for example, and it just pulls up the website that's still there. So obviously it is a long route. It is 268 miles, but a map can only show you so much. And this is one of those things that I was dying to know more about. Uh, and I'm so glad we have John on the show today was in regards to what this route looks like and feels like, because uh, for those of us who haven't been, haven't run in the fells or Northumberland National Park or any of that, what are, what is the terrain like? Is it super rugged, rocky? Is it deep bogs, uh, mud? Like, what are you dealing with on this type of 268 mile route? Well, and, and first of all, I, I'd encourage people that, that view that map to, to zoom in all the way on it and the resolution will switch over to a different scale um, and, and detail on the map with the, the, the ordnance survey maps here that have done the entire country and just incredible detail where every little footpath, every little crag, everything is, is on that map. And there's just this network of rights of way and, and yeah. footpaths stretching all over the country. I have it pulled up and here. So, so yeah, you can keep talking. I have it pulled up so they can it, see. It, yeah. And, and so, um, you know, the, the Penine Way is, is the first national trail in, in England. Uh, and so it, it stretches a, across really the, the backbone or the spine of England from uh, the, the Scottish borders uh, down uh, into to central England. And it, it crosses uh, a, a variety, a wide variety of terrain from just these remote beautiful mountains with with moorland uh where you can see uh, for for ages just completely clear views uh to to going through farm farmland and, and just to, again where you're cutting across footpaths through people's pastures and, and fields uh going through little villages along the way um through moors and and, and boggy sections where it really appears that there's no sort of path at all mm. um there are stakes in the ground and at certain times of year those stakes in the ground are essentially buoys to help you navigate what is a boggy river channel um but yeah it's it's just an amazing stretch of the country that you get to see uh and to me i was actually thinking this week you mentioned running in london and, and that's that's so many of us in the U S we think of the UK and we think of London and like, that's our, our vision of, of what England is and what the UK is. And even when I started coming over here for work, that's where I went. But now it's like, that is the absolute last thing I think of. Like I think of these, these wide open, uh, hills and all the little villages and, and all the, the people, uh, along the way that, that are out there. And it's just, um, an amazing countryside and it's amazing to have so much freedom to, to move within it where, where again these these rights of way the networks just go all over the place i mean you could walk from point a to point b pretty much anywhere in the country using public rights of way going through fields amazing it's incredible and we did, we talked about this on one of our daily live streams but um the map itself is just incredible and bring it like up again. we don't have our maps here don't look like that. And we spend a fair amount of time just kind of browsing around on them, just looking at the different markings and all the all the very small details on there, including like cattle guards and and things like Sheep that. Sheep yeah. dip, uh, you know, everything has a name. Roman, Roman forts, you know, stone age hill forts and, and burial mounds, like all sorts of stuff that's that's on there and just incredible detail. Um, and since we're talking about terrain, there's been actually a couple of questions specifically about the bogs around Tan Hill. So people are asking how you managed to run run that area. Yeah, so that's uh, Slate Home Moor that is going uh, up to Tan Hill Inn this time, going north to south. I, I had the good fun of, of going up that rather than down it. And I've there were some muddy and boggy sections this time around, but I've definitely seen Slate Home in much worse conditions. That's actually specifically what I was referencing when I said at certain times of year, there are stakes in the ground that mm -hmm. look like buoys in a river. Um, so I, I had great support runners with me at the time who knew the best line through that. And we navigated it fairly well to where there was just a, a few spots where I sank, you know, 
up above my ankles. Didn't didn't get stuck anywhere. Didn't face plan anywhere. So that's that's a pretty successful run through there. And and that's another thing where it's just it's such an advantage to to really know the local terrain. And if you're on a line that like if you're five or ten feet over uh, from the best line, it, it could it could be disastrous because you end up falling waist deep into a bog. Uh, rather than running on the actual trail. Yeah, it seems like, I mean, what's, but again, kind of going back to the maps and just, I, I, as a map, I don't know, I love maps. As a map <laughs> lover, I love being able to zoom in and seeing the more intricate detail. And as someone like you, who I'm sure is so familiar with topography maps and, and, and having been in orienteering training just to get through Barkley and having all that sort of background, I'm sure this is also really fun for you. But knowing, like looking at a map and knowing what uh, certain uh, ways it's drawn represent bogs or, or, you know, different types of landscapes, seeing it and feeling it and being there can really come down to experience uh, or having experienced people with you that can navigate through those things quickly and efficiently. So how important was having people around you a part of this journey helping you navigate these things, especially when in the later stages, because this isn't just like a hundred miler, which is weird to say just a hundred miles, <laughs> 268 miles. There's probably a point where you start to just, all your trust is put on the people who are pacing you or crewing you. Like at what point does that happen and how important is it? Yeah, it's, it's enormous. And it's really just a, a matter of being able to mentally tune that stuff out. Like you're dealing mm -hmm. with so much on a run like this, that being able to not worry about those things and focus on the things that you alone can do, like move your own two feet forward and, and keep going. Uh, you just, you need all the mental energy you can get uh, to, to be able to do that. And so generally, it, I, well, I always had at least two people with me. Uh, and so one person is a bit out in front, um, close enough to where I can see them but far enough to where they can negotiate any bogs, find the best line, uh, open any gates that, that are along the way, um, yeah. have that, all that sorted before I get there. Uh, and then there's a second person that's back with me with, with the food and the water and trying to shove stuff down my throat and, and keep me alert and whatnot. Right. And so really at that point, you know, my job is continue moving forward, get my feet to move and, and that's it. And it's just, um, enormous in terms of the mental energy saved but also in terms of preventing any small kind of micro navigation errors that again can result in you being sunk into a bog uh, right. rather than running forward uh live questions let's get to some of those yeah, just a comment here from Leon. Leon says we're pretty lucky and yes our maps are great and most importantly the pubs are marked too. <laughs> <laughs> Probably can't make many stops. I, <laughs> just efficiency. We've talked about it with specifically other FKT efforts because it's one thing in a race environment, being able to roll into an aid station, grab your stuff and go. Because you can usually run lighter in a race because you have more aid stations in, in some cases, obviously not all of them. But with an FKT, you're probably self-sufficient to, to a large degree, especially in some of the more remote sections. How important is time efficiency when you're chasing an FKT on a 268 mile route, where we're not just talking 24 hours, 12 hours, two hours, it's 58 plus hours. How important is efficiency? And how important was it for you to dial that in? It, it, it's huge. Um, and you know, I, th that's again, where I, I have complete trust in the road support crew. That's, that's meeting us at uh, road crossings and uh, resupplying me, getting me food. Um, additional food there, um, swapping out support runners. Uh, that's a huge piece of that. And, and really it's, you know, at the beginning, I kind of said, I, I don't want to sit down unless I have to swap out shoes or something. Mm -hmm. I didn't co completely, um, manage that. Uh, and that is one place that when I look back, I, I, I kind of, and, and analyze what I did, I think, well, I, sh I should have, I should have shaved off a, a minute there or a minute here. And it's, on things of this length, that stuff just adds up so, so quickly. Yeah. Um, that, you know, a minute or two at each stop, that's, you know, you're looking at an hour uh, of time. Uh, my One of my favorite stats is, is from when I did finish Barkley and I had 30 minutes to spare. And it's like, oh, you had 30 minutes. 
if I had taken an extra 30 seconds per hour, I would not have finished. Right. And so that's the sort of way that little things add up. And, um, I, I did really well, um, for the first 200 miles or so. Uh, and, and then, uh, I, I started having trouble staying awake, a, a bit of trouble, uh, keeping food down. And so I, I stopped to, to take a nap. Um, I woke up after 10 minutes cause I, I got cold. I was shivering uncontrollably. So I stayed there for a bit longer to, to warm up, uh, maybe a bit longer than I, I should have, but it's, it's a fine line at that point as well. And for the remainder of the run, I was stopping a bit more at support points to, to get more food down, to get more calories in. Uh, and, and it's, it's kind of one of those things where you want to keep moving as quickly as you can without blowing up. Mm. Uh, and so I, I knew I had the record in hand. I was out there to, to push and go as hard as I could, but it, it, you walk such a fine line at the end of these things. And, and you might look at the tracker and you might say, oh, there's six hours left and he's three hours ahead. It, that's easy. But like at that point, just, just anything, you, you can implode, you can crash and burn. And, and 20 miles seems like a, 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 an absolute eternity at, at that point. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a big trade-off and I, I don't know, always know, uh, what the, the best answer is, but I, I think that, you know, I was fairly close to optimal uh, on this one. It's uh, amazing again, as a spectator and sort of a fan to see how, again, I, I want to point out that John set the Pennine way FKT last year, July 16th, which I believe it was 30 years. That was, that was an FKT that was set. For decades, right? Yeah, back back in 1989. Wow, 89, it's a yeah. it's amazing to think that it stood for so long, which just is a testament to the stoutness of the record. To break it in July 20, uh, 2020, seven days later or a week later, Damian Hall again sets it even lower, and then John being able to come back this year and set it even lower. You know, you're you're getting to a point where every little second counts and we we hear that from fkts now where it's getting down to just the finite detail of someone handing you a bottle you know 200 feet outside of your aid so you when you're running in you're already eating and drinking and you're out so it's like there's not much leeway and it's just crazy to think that this whole time you were pushing for 268 miles on you, you talked about the fine line or that that edge like a razor's edge of push too hard and you blow up and that that cost you three hours or you hold that line and you get that three hours it's just a testament john to your experience and your ability it, it, it is amazing man it is a masterful feat uh let's get to some more live questions because there, there's plenty of them here uh yeah a question from phil phil says your three woman crew seemed like your rock throughout how did you choose the team uh so it was it was largely uh getting the the, the team together from get, getting the band back together from last year. Uh, and so, uh, Nikki Ligo was, was kind of my crew chief and she, uh, did that last year as well. Uh, Jen Scottney supported me, uh, on the road for a good chunk of my, my grand round last year. And, and Sharon Dyson, uh, joined for a good chunk of, of the Penine way last year as well. So these are people that, uh, a, I, I fully trust and B they, they know me and they kind of know my quirks and, and what my needs are and, and what I'll eat. And you know, when I'm actually bad versus I just look bad. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so that's, that's an important part of this, uh, really is, is support runners and, and support crew, uh, knowing how to respond to uh, a given situation and, and a runner's condition. Kim and I were just talking about this the other day. We've seen this evolution with you uh, over the years. Like we got to witness you on loop four of the Barkley, having no sleep, you know, stumbling by the yellow gate and having a crew there. Like we need to give John some sleep. And it, like, I've never seen a human in that state ever. And uh, you didn't finish Barkley that year, but you did the next. Like you did come back and you did finish Barkley because you got better. You got more more skilled and you learn from your experience 
And here you are now doing a 268 mile journey through crazy difficult terrain, not sleeping for 200 of those miles. What do you think has been your biggest lesson over these years in the last like five or six years as you've grown as an athlete, you've gotten better and stronger and faster. It is crazy to watch you evolve. Uh, what do you think you've learned? And is there still more to learn? Wow. W one thing that I've learned, that's uh, that, that's a tough one. Um, <laughs> you, can, hell, you can give me 50 things you've learned. I, I, would yeah, just hear I, John. I, mean, I love your voice and I love hearing what you have to say and learning. <laughs> It's, uh, it's, it's kind of like Barkley itself where there's really no single thing, um, on these types of challenges. You're not going to go out and just be super fast and crush it. You're not going to just be mentally strong and crush it. You, you've got to, you, you, you've got to raise up these things and it, it will, these things will find your weakest link and it will hit you there and it will mm -hmm. break you there. Um, so it is a matter of, of, I've improved my fitness, uh, significantly. I've been working with David Roach for, for two years now. Um, I have improved my, uh, I would say my mental strength, but I don't think it's my mental strength so much as just learning how to use it. Um, what to tell myself in these situations, what I need to focus on, uh, when I'm again, when I'm in an actual rough spot versus just when I'm at a bad time of day, like I know that there are certain windows of the day where I'm going to hit a low point and I'm going to get sleepy and I'm going to get cranky and I just need to get through that window of time, uh, and, and I'll be better, uh, learning what, what to eat, what my stomach responds to, um, and, you know, that's that's been an adaptive process in itself. Uh, one of the funny things I, I had going into this on some of my longer training runs, I learned that from my experience on, on the Penine Way last year, where I, I actually I, I got an ulcer and my stomach was just absolutely wrecked. Uh, I had a bit of, of PTSD of the stomach from that. Mm -hmm. and, and some of the things that used to work really well for me um, – you know, it's like when you eat something and you get sick later, right. then then the thought of that food makes you nauseous, even if it's not what made you sick. And, and I had that same thing. I would think about taking something out of my pack and I would get queasy in a tight stomach. Mm. And and so, you know, constantly learning and, and adapting uh, to these things uh, has has really been a, a huge lesson, uh, I feel like. Uh, and And then as as we've already discussed uh, efficiency um so in the uk they, they they say don't don't faff uh so you come into the support points and 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 don't faff get get moving um don't waste any time uh and so that's mm -hmm. been a, a huge part of that and you kind of saw that evolution at, at barclay as well um to in, in those latter years where the first couple of loops i would turn it around without even sitting down and swap out packs and get going i can Man, I can only imagine how it's just a continued evolution. Um, not knowing that you had uh, stomach issues uh, with the ulcer and, and things like that, like that can cause so many, yeah, foods that worked years may not work anymore and having to sort of reanalyze what could potentially work. Um, yeah. I did see the photo beforehand of your array of food items for this. I, I couldn't help but just zoom in on the photo and like break apart like, okay, he's got pancakes. I don't know what these pancakes are. These, uh, these other packages and chips and you had so many different items. Was there something that you went, I got to have that, like, this is the thing I'm eating. And did that shift halfway through or anything like that? Really? The, the, one of the MVPs of, of my, uh, support here is my eight month old daughter. Um, she, uh, I got the idea from her of, of the little baby food, food pouches yes. uh, that are just in a squeeze pouch. They're basically pureed fruit. And really for like the, the last eight to 10 hours while I was on the move, that's, that's about all I could eat, um, was, was those. So I was, I was downing those left and right. I think my support crew had to go to the store and, and get more of them. And so it's, it's a matter of, of having that, that huge stash, you, you know, it's not like I think I'm actually going to eat all that, but you have to have variety and, and you never know what your stomach is going to need, um, what it's, what your body's going to get deficient on and start craving or what it's going to absolutely start hating. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and those, those could flip 
uh, during the run uh, on something like this. There could be something you love at the start and hate at the end or, or vice versa. Uh, so I, again, learning those things and kind of expanding my, my repertoire uh, has, has been a big part of that. And, and just w one other thing, I guess I'll, I'll add to the, the what have I learned is figuring out kind of what, what pace I can push um, before things like mm -hmm. my stomach starts imploding um, and, and other issues start, um, start happening. So I've learned now from my own experience and, and comparisons with other people's runs, I have a nice method of kind of plotting out what my pace over the course of a run like this should look like. And, and there's always going to be some slowing down associated with it. You know, one's going to run even splits for 260 miles. Right. Um, but again, that just goes back to, to learning your own body and, and learning how you respond to things and, and what works best for you. Great insight. I mean, this is all huge insight for a lot yeah. of runners. A lot of UK based questions. I'll let uh, get to some of that. But James in the chat says, Faff, a word commonly used by my wife, who is from Manchester. I noticed the usage of the word faff. Uh, I don't really know what it means, but I, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming it just, means like no bullshit. It, it just just don't mess around. Like, yeah. Don't dilly dally. Get 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 going. I I I want to adopt it, but I don't want to be that guy that lives in Washington that adopted faff. And people are like, "What are you doing, dude? <laughs> <laughs> don't do like, that. Stop trying to make faff happen." <laughs> but it's faff. It's faff. It's awesome. Uh, so yeah, let's get to some Oh, and fun. Joanne in the chat room asked, John, have you added, I think it's Tunnox tea cakes or Tunnox wafers to your race diet yet? I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah, yeah. So I've, I've, I've done a good deal with Tunnox. Um, I, I didn't have any uh, on this run. I, I, they're a, a little bit drier than, than I prefer. They, they are a, a nice treat. I would compare them kind of to like a, um, a, a nutty bar, except instead of peanut butter, it's got caramel in it. Um, mm. and the, the tea cakes are absolutely delicious. I mean, that's basically just like a little wafer with a giant melted marshmallow covered in chocolate, um, which I do love those, but they, they they're not, they're not something you want to go running with. They'll, <laughs> they'll, they'll get smashed pr pretty quickly. More, like, I think we talked about this during or after the ground round. Kind of sounds like a wagon wheel. What? <laughs> TK, the TK, the description of it of like a oh I don't even know what a wagon like a wheel is. Marshmallow covered in chocolate kind of reminds me of like a wagon wheel. It's it's, it's it's much it's it's much poofier. Oh, okay. uh, and so it just not... has the wafer on the bottom, nothing on top. Yeah, I remember Got this it. conversation after the grand round when we had John on and we were talking specifically about snack food because I think at that point you were still finding new snack foods and getting recommendations and stuff like that. Um, have you dialed in your your local? grabs because you probably don't have access to what you have access to in Tennessee or anything in the South that you're probably used to for, for Barkley and stuff like that. So have you found your go-tos? Yeah. So I, I, I do have a, a, an actual spreadsheet. Um, and it's, it's got us and, and UK, uh, selections it. on it. I love <laughs> so, it so much. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's got the options. It's got the calories, each one. So I've just got to go in and fill in how many of each I've got and, Boom. There's my, my race supplies. It's so good. It's so good. <laughs> and, but you know, when you get to the level like John and, and I know John to be very meticulous and detailed, like this is exactly what I dream of having. If I'm ever running a race, like I wish I had a spreadsheet with snacks and I could just plug in the number. And well, now you have, now you have goals. an activity for tonight. <laughs> I've, got, I've got nightly goals here. Well, and it's, it, and it's, it's quite the spreadsheet to look at if, if you don't know the context and it's just like, <laughs> Oh, 12 white chocolate Snickers, 16 Oreos, <laughs> half a dozen Pop Tarts. <laughs> but 17 baby you know, food my, containers. My, like, wait, what? My, my son my son came over, um, my, my oldest one, while I was packing some of this stuff, and he pointed at one thing and he was like, Is, is that healthy? I said, No, no, none <laughs> of this is healthy. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> I, uh, uh, well, yeah, we have live questions, live questions here. I'll let you get to some of those. Questions. Yeah. This question was asked in, uh, our discord server from Deb and What's up, Deb? Deb says, uh, John, I recall you saying how your parents, uh, how your parents, when seeing you for the first time at Barkley, couldn't fathom how far you had pushed your limits. Crew was encouraging you back out onto a loop while your parents thought you should probably go to the emergency room. Since then, uh, have your accomplishments, so, uh, since... <laughs> 
pardon me, since then you have accomplished so incredibly much more. I'm curious what their thoughts are now about your athletic ultra feats. Great question, Dan. Yeah, so they've they've always been extremely supportive and and proud of of what I've done. Uh, but yeah, that first time that was their first exposure to anything in the world of ultra running, and so they'd they'd really never seen anyone like that. Um, and, and so now they've gotten a bit more used to that. But of course, uh, you know that they, they are still parents and and they're still going to worry. And so uh, that that will always be be an aspect of that. And that's um, you know I, I try to do everything I can to that the, the, they love that there's trackers and and other things of, of that nature. And uh, to be honest, my my wife uh, Jesse does a a great job of of communicating with them to ensure that. Uh, they've they've got uh, everything covered there. Yeah, and shout out to Jesse too. Again, she she's so awesome. I've had the the fortune of meeting her and just the support. You have such an awesome family, John, and I imagine that's a huge huge uh, inspiration for you to keep pushing and to get it done. And seeing the video of you finish um, the the Penn and Way FKT this last time, it was. Again, the, what was really great about this was the tracking was incredible. We were able to look at this beautifully detailed map and follow you the entire way and see where Damien's time was, where you were with, with the dots and sort of tracking it. And then lots of video and photos from your crew, which was great. And seeing the video of you finish was, I mean, it's just super heartfelt because I could tell you were emotional, you were exhausted, but also uh, uh, just your family being there and them so excited. Your kids are like, ah, oh, you know, you can tell that they're really excited. <laughs> But they don't know whether to like touch you or hug you because is daddy going to puke? It, like no one really knows. Uh, how important is having your family, man, at the finish or, or being a part of oh, this? That, that was just absolutely incredible to, to have them there. Um, and, and it's, you know, not something that, that we were able to, to work out on, on some of my challenges last year with the timing and, and the distance that they were. So that was another great aspect of going north to south this time. I was finishing closer to home. Uh, to where they could make that trip. And it's something that, you know, I, I didn't intentionally make my schedule this way, but from the start, from the outset, I knew that, hey, John, get your butt to Edel, get you, get to the finish fast enough, and your family will be able to be there. Uh, versus if I had gone gone too slow, it would have been later in the evening, uh, too late for the, the kids to make the trip up there. and And so that was big ad, added incentive uh, mm. to, to get there in time and, and then over the, the home stretch, uh, getting there to see them. And uh, yeah, like you said, uh, having my my kids see that and, and be a part of that uh, is, is just incredible. It's uh, it, it was a really amazing effort to follow. We'll get to maybe one more question here in the main show, and then we'll move right into the after show with John. But it really was an amazing effort to follow. Again, a testament to the technology, the crew, the, the people. The tracking was so good. It was so good. Uh, super reliable. Yeah. I also imagine that's the infrastructure that the UK has just in this general region and stuff. But those detailed maps, everything just felt like we were kind of a part of it, even though we're thousands of miles away. So shout out to everyone involved, not just uh, a John running. Of course, that's the coolest part to follow is John just crushing, uh, doing <laughs> doing what he does best. Uh, but again, a huge, a huge shout out to John and his accomplishment. Um, 58 hours, four minutes, 23 seconds. Is that the official time or is there like an official official? Does it have to be ratified with something like this? Uh, I, I think 53 seconds. 53 seconds. So. Oh, 53 seconds. What did <laughs> I say? 23. Yeah, 23. Uh, you, my... you gave me an extra 30 there. That's, uh, <laughs> that could be all the difference one it day. Could be. So it someone's could going to come in and, and, and sniff a few seconds off of it. <laughs> Can't allow it. Um, uh, it's amazing, man. Amazing. Uh, so in less than three days, you know, 268 miles, did you run through all the nights? I'm assuming running or, uh, or so power I, hiking? It, yeah. So um, the, the 60 hours, what was a, a big threshold for me is no one had, had done that before. And that's that's the two and a half day mark. Um, it's also, of course, the Barkley magic number. Uh, I, I did. I, I went to I intended to try to get through it without sleeping, uh, and I got to a point. Really, I was I was great, 200 miles in, uh, with about 75 miles left. My crew was giving me weather forecasts for the finish the following evening, and I was even joking, you know, what about the afternoon? Um, 
And shortly after that, I, I really started to struggle to stay awake. I started getting to that point where I'm stumbling around and not able to keep my eyes open. So uh, I, I did go down for a, a nap, woke up about 10 minutes later, um, shivering pretty uncontrollably. And so had to stop and warm up um, and then napped again a bit later for another 10 minutes. So total two two naps of about 10 minutes, um, over, over the whole thing. Wow. It's amazing, man. It's freaking amazing. I mean, having Maggie Guterrell on last week's show talking about a 20 minute nap over two fifty. Right. <laughs> this is, I mean, it just continues to blow our mind. John Kelly, you are, uh, a maestro. It, it is a <laughs> privilege to have you on the show. Let's get to maybe one more live question. We'll do our GR crew member of the week and we'll move right into our after show with John Kelly. Yeah, Run Adventure in the chat asked, what's the best view on the route or are there views on the route? Did you have a magical place that you wanted to just stop and take it in? Uh, so my favorite part is, is High Cup Nick. It's coming out, um, well, it, it's just above Dufton. Uh, and and so it's just this enormous uh, valley uh, that has been carved out by a glacier who knows how long ago and just amazing views looking out over it uh that is one thing going north to south um you, you don't get quite as good of a view of high cup nick you don't get quite as good of a view of some of the waterfalls that are shortly after high cup nick uh but still that's that's an amazing part um of it for me and i I appreciated this time finishing in the day, finishing with somewhat clear skies, getting a view uh, from from Kinder Scout uh, on down to to Edale. That was a, a a pretty beautiful sight for me this time. Amazing! I'm actually like going through the map here, uh, trying to find High Cup Nick. I found Dufton. Did you find it? There's High, High Cup, Cup Gill. Gill. And I see High Cup Plain. Uh, it's somewhere in here, and our <laughs> UK viewers will be like dude it's right there how do you not see it yeah it's 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 basically right just I cup nick. just I cup nick. east yeah. of, of dufton yeah boom that looks it just looks like it's over a, a beautiful uh well i'm gonna imagine it's called a gill uh <laughs> beautiful view down over dufton it looks i mean the maps i'm looking at the maps and i can kind of read a map <laughs> i'm pretty good at that <laughs> and it looks like beautiful terrain um that's awesome and dave in the chat room says hi cup nick is awesome one of my favorite places Nice. We gotta go. Do you I got mean, 268 miles on your legs? John could be our tour guide. I mean, like international travel, right? Oh yeah, uh, there's that. <laughs> there is you, that. You, you can head. You can head right up for Dufton. That's that's another part of the beauty of it. You can. Uh, it, this is a great trail to enjoy over many days and stop and enjoy the, the villages along the way. See, I think I'd like to do that. Yeah, same. <laughs> and if there's pubs, if pubs are marked on the map. Yeah, I'd like to do that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's that's my kind of jam. Mo Are, most of the pubs you can stay in them, so they're they're kind of like stop. pubs slash accommodations. All right. So. See, this is why yeah, I like, like the now UK. We're talking. Like, <laughs> <laughs> need more routes like this. Uh, our guest tonight, John Kelly, a, an incredible athlete. We've had him on the show a number of times, and it seems like every time we've had him on, have him on the show, it's something bigger. It's something. Uh, uh, more dramatic and and more legendary. Today, we were just talking about the Pennine Way, and I know we're just scratching the surface. Uh, we are going to move into our after show with John. You can join us in our after show. All you got to do is go to patreon.com slash the ginger runner, and you can join us for all of our after shows uh, and some really cool perks on the back end, including daily live streams and stuff like that. But uh, I won't mention that again. I do want to give John an opportunity to plug uh, where you can follow him. So if you want to see what John gets up to next, uh, I'm assuming it's going to be a lot of recovery and just relaxing and chilling. But if you want to follow him, John, where can people find you? Where can people follow? Uh, so my my handle on most platforms is, is Random Forest Runner. Uh, so that's on Instagram, uh, Facebook page, Twitter. It's a slightly abbreviated version of that because of Twitter rules. Uh, but then I also have a blog at randomforestrunner.com that has links to all of my social media and my Strava and, and everything else. So. And you just uh, you just announced on Instagram that you're probably going to be doing like a daily sort of breakdown of uh, what occurred over the last 268 miles. So, yeah, follow on Instagram, right? Because you'll be doing a breakdown there as well as your blog 
or just Instagram? Yeah, I'll, I'll eventually do uh, do a, a full write up on my blog uh, of this. Uh, I'm just not in as much of a hurry to, to do that this time. Generally, mm-hmm. those are a bit detailed. I, I put a good amount of effort into them. And uh, this year, I, I don't have a rush of, of someone else coming to take the record a week later. <laughs> so I love it. I'll, I'll get it there and Instagram uh, in, in the meantime. Well, I, for one, can't wait for John to write a book. I'll be first in line to read the book. I, I hope that's on the horizon. The centerfold is just a snack spreadsheet. Ah, <laughs> You're just like this is this. really actually a 37 page book. That's still classified. It'll have to wait a, few, a couple decades after my career until that's uh, de- declassified there. I like that it's classified. Like it's coveted I information. get it. Uh, our guest tonight, John Kelly, just set the fastest known time on the Pennine Way for the second time in a year. Uh, Damien Hall said it in between, but uh, John Kelly now has the title back uh, in a stout time of 58 hours, 4 minutes and 53 seconds. It's uh, just a bonkers time. I can only imagine what that train is like. I can't wait to visit someday. Uh, before we wrap up the show, move into our after show with John. We do like to recognize members of the community who go above and beyond here uh, on this channel. We call it our GR Crew Member of the Week. Kim has already pulled aside this week's crew member. Kim, who is this week's GR crew member? So I pulled two GR crew members this week um, who both separately on their own, not together, were doing really fun Grand Canyon adventures this weekend. Cool. Uh, So Till set out to do the rim to rim to rim. I think Till was going one way and staying on the north rim overnight and then heading back. And then also Jared R who finished the rim to rim. And it sounds like they both had amazing adventures, beautiful uh, pictures posted over on Discord as well. Awesome. Congratulations to uh, our crew members of the week. We appreciate you all. We are live every single day. We are live uh, with Ginger Runner Live every Monday. So tune in again uh, for next week's show. Tonight was great with John. We're going to go right into our after show. Thank you so much, everybody. And also just very quick, thank you to all the new viewers and folks that were actually able to join us live today. It was really fun to see some new names and uh, some folks that we only get usually get to check, catch in Discord or yeah. in archive versions. Uh, to everyone who maybe doesn't regularly watch GRL, it is awesome to see the chat room just flooded with people from across the globe. Uh, it it really makes us feel good. We know it makes our guests feel awesome. So thank you for staying up late. Thank you for waking up early. Or maybe or it was just the right time just the right for you. Time in the middle of the day. So we appreciate <laughs> you so much. We'll see you in the after show. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, all. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. Ginger Runner.